there and welcome to my favorite topic in the world of wine which is wine marketing uh, when you look at the industry you can see there are 150,000 wines for sale in the US market and frankly all of them are pretty good making wine uh, we pretty much have that down and I think you will agree as you have tasted through wines in various ways in your career and through this program um, the differences in wines are relatively small often difficult to distinguish uh, but marketing is the one area where wineries are given an opportunity to really stand out uh, step forward and create a name for themselves that will give them value for a long time to come. And we'll talk about that a little more as the lecture goes on. The three big questions you need to get in terms of wine marketing are, how are we unique? Does anyone care about that? Uh, you've heard me quote uh, Elizabeth Slater saying that every winery says we're a small family winery. We carefully blah, 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 blah. Uh, the question is, how are you different from other wineries? And why should people care about that? If you're different because your wines are made on in volcanic soils that have a slightly higher iron content, I don't think anybody cares about that. But if you can touch them, if you can reach them on a human level, uh, with a difference that they recognize, that's great marketing. And then the next question, which is something that wineries very rarely think about um, and is hugely important, what audience can we own? Um, it's hard enough to realize that there are, what, 80 million wine consumers in the USA, for example, uh, and you have 3,000, 5,000, 10,000 cases of wine to sell, or there are 8 million people in the San Francisco Bay Area and you want to gain a percentage of those. But the real question is, is there a core group? Is there a group of consumers that you can make uh, develop a real relationship with your brand because that's ultimately marketable marketable and if you remember our conversations on some of the case studies like Maomi if you have a core group of consumers that really care about your product that is an absolutely marketable asset that that is marketable I mean, it's worth hundreds of millions of dollars and then the third question of course is how can we intersect these two in some way to figure out how many customers do we need to actually sell our wine? General consensus is to sell a bottle of wine, you need a customer. Yeah, most customers buy, let's say, two bottles of wine, but often they shop in pairs. So let's just say nice round numbers, and for some people this will be a little different, but in general, I like to have the idea that if you make, let's say, 2,000 cases of wine, you need 24,000 customers. And if you think it's easy to sell 2,000 cases of wine, make a list of the 24,000 customers you're going to reach, and then we can talk. It's really hard work. Okay, a few definitions. Uh, the goal of marketing. The goal of marketing is to open the door. And the example I always use is it's a Saturday morning and you're sitting at home and the doorbell rings and you open the door and there are the two cute little girls in their green uniforms. And the question isn't, are you going to buy Girl Scout cookies? The question is, how many boxes of those thin mints are you going to pay for? Um, very different experience when the doorbell rings half an hour later and you get the two young gentlemen with the skinny neckties and they're holding Bibles under their arms and you decide not to open the door because frankly the Girl Scouts have much better marketing than Jehovah's Witnesses. Uh, there, I've said it. Uh, and, and the result then is that if you have good marketing, it really supports sales. It really understands distribution. It really helps move the product all the way through from your door into the onto the consumer's table or into the consumer's mouth. If you have bad marketing, the door doesn't open, uh, the wine doesn't sell, and you wonder what's wrong with the wine. And the answer is probably nothing is really wrong with the wine. The answer is something is probably wrong with your marketing. So let's talk about what marketing means. And to do that, first of all, we're going to talk about defining a, a position. To define your position, you first need to understand your business. How are you going to sell the wine? Uh, how much of it are you going to sell? Are you going to sell it all direct to consumer out of your tasting room? or like Santa Margarita in our case study there, are you going to sell it at least initially exclusively uh, to Italian restaurants? How are you gonna create this distribution and sales network that's gonna sell your product through? And how much product are you going to sell? 
then you look at the size of the market. Now, one of the things that was a huge advantage to Santa Margarita is every community in America has at least one and often 10 or 20 or 100 Italian restaurants. So they then had a target market that they could identify and say, it's big enough, we can really sell some wine. You need to do the same thing for your idea, for your concept, for your business. Where is it that we're going to go? How many of them are there and how can we reach them? And then ultimately, the real key is now that we've done that, how can we convince them that our product, our unique selling proposition, obviously it's unique, can't be duplicated anywhere else. If you want this, you got to get it from me. So. How are you different? Why should people care? And how many customers do you need? Um, how are you different? Please don't talk about the way you make your wine because the way you make your wine is pretty much, as we've said before, the way just about everybody makes their wines. How are you different? Well, I'm going to suggest that the easiest way for wineries to differentiate themselves is how they market their wines. And I don't just mean bring it to market. I mean talk about it, communicate about it, build community around the brand. All of those are key elements to marketing. How are you doing those differently from your competition? Is your website noticeably different? Are your advertisements noticeably different? Or is your newsletter, are your emails? What's different about you? And then how do you communicate that? And of course, critically here, why should people care? Uh, if you don't make that human connection with them, it'll never work. And then of course, lay that over the scheme of how many customers do you need? So what will you make? This is a marketing decision. It's not a winemaking decision. You're not going to plant what everybody else plants and make what everybody else makes and then say, okay, now we need a marketing plan because you've already made the most critical mistake in marketing. You have failed to distinguish yourselves from the competition. So making a decision about what you will make and how you will do it is a marketing decision, not a production decision. Production ultimately serves the goal of marketing. Marketing is delivering the product to the consumer. And we've seen from our case study of Louis Martini, for example, making lots of different wines to make a lot of different customers uh, happy isn't actually a very good idea because in the long run, you don't build a strong sense of identity around the brand. You become a jack of all trades, a master of none, and ultimately you sell your product, your entire company to another owner, another company. And where will you sell it? That's a marketing decision. Santa Margarita chose restaurants only. Many small wineries choose DTC only or tasting room only. If you're interested in building a brand, uh, traditional wisdom is it's better to sell your wine into restaurants because each bottle at a restaurant will be tasted by at least two and possibly as many as six or eight different people. If you sell your wine to a retail shop, you may have one fan who goes in and buys all that wine, but he takes that wine, takes a case of it home, puts it in his cellar and promises himself to open it in 10 years. If you're trying to build a brand and increase exposure, he's just taken 12 of your bottles off the market and limited your exposure. So these are the kinds of decisions that are marketing decisions that ultimately have a big impact on the brand and ultimately what matters, what will have value at the end of the day is your brand. And then of course, you always need to take into account your financial analysis, your cash flow. The fact that your wine is for sale on the 1st of January does not mean you're gonna start showing revenue on the 2nd of January. So how many cases can you sell? Where will you sell them? You need to do this work in advance rather than just saying, well, we're gonna give this a shot. Here's how we're gonna try. Um, remember e and, uh, Yoda's great line, um, don't try. How many cases can you sell? Where will this happen? And make a list, start, start developing a database. Uh, marketing is all about data and databases are a key element to marketing. Start making a list of which customers you have, who they are, where they live, how you contact them. Um, and, and first, of course, how many do you need, but also how many more do you need? Uh, how do you transform your customers as we noticed in that sales funnel, how do we transform our contacts into customers? So how many people are there in your target market? Great question. 
uh, in San Francisco Bay Area that are 8 million, but how many of those drink wine? Now, that's another question entirely. Where do they live? Are there certain pockets? For example, in the, in the great old days of direct marketing, which you may know as junk mail, um, you could buy lists and you could buy magazine subscription lists and you could buy data lists, for example, that would cross-reference. How many people in the Bay Area read the Wine Spectator? Okay, those are serious wine people. Let's put them on a list. Then let's cross-reference those against people who buy Coach Leather, for example, or L.L. Bean, people who buy quality materials um, by direct mail. Now we've got people who are comfortably buying direct mail and are interested in wine, and if we cross those two and pick out only the people who belong to both databases, now we have a really good potential way of creating a market, uh, a, a list of people who are potential customers. Who are they? And how many of them are there? And then ultimately, how can you turn them into your customers by buying your product? And that involves creating a unique selling proposition. How are you special and why should people care? Um, again, it doesn't have to do with how you make the wine. In rare cases it may, but unless you are making a truly different wine, unless you are making a wine that you can explain to a 12-year-old child, this is why my wine is completely different from all the others, you don't have a special wine. What you need is a special proposition. What is it you get when you buy this wine? And that ultimately, for most small wineries, I think has to do with that human connection. Building some kind of contact, building some kind of relationship that they can't get with other wineries. And that means you've got to be better at that stuff than your competition. Will it sell wine? Absolutely. Do people care about how they are treated and how a winery portrays itself? I'm going to argue that the primary reason people buy wine, they know they're going to buy wine. How do they choose that wine? It's because of how that wine makes them feel, and I don't mean drunk. I mean, how does it make them feel when they pick that bottle up and serve it on their table, when they order that wine in a restaurant and the waiter brings it to the table? How does it make them feel? That's why they buy the wine. That's And notice, that all happens before the bottle is opened. So let's start with a few definitions. Marketing, as we've said, is preparing the ground for sales. It's uh, selecting the site, it's planting the vines, it's trellising, it's pruning, it's all of that stuff. Sales is harvesting the crop. Sales, if you remember your story from Rumpelstiltskin, the little kid story, um, who could spin straw into gold, sales is turning wine inventory into cash. Walk into any winery's warehouse and there are stacks of cases of wine. And sales is simply transforming those cases into dollars. Marketing is the preparation of that, is the development of that, is the communication of that to make sales easier. And then let's define a brand. It's a symbol in the customer's mind. When people hear that name, when they see that logo, it brings to mind emotions. Not an intellectual uh, recognition, but an emotional connection. Uh, Apple is, of course, the most powerful brand in the world, and it is because they sell lifestyle. They don't sell electronics. They sell how you live your life, and they've been enormously successful at it. And, of course, then positioning, how are you different? And Apple couldn't be uh, clearer, whereas IBM was international business machines and was all about business, Apple said, we are the computers that allow you to express you, to allow you to express yourself. The ads for the new iPhone, if you've noticed the billboards, don't even talk about how it performs as a phone. They are simply huge and gorgeous photographs taken with the new iPhone, so people know that what they have to do is buy the phone so they can take photographs like that which they can if they're as good as the photographers who took those photographs. So brand is a symbol that consumers associate with your company and its products. Mayomi is a brand. Santa Margarita is a brand. Culinary Institute of America is a brand. And here's the cool thing. It is a direct measure of your marketing success. So for example, and this is, a, this is a wonderful exercise I encourage you to do at, at, uh, every once in a while when you talk about your company. If someone came along and wanted, you decided for one reason or another you've got to sell your company now, 
and someone comes along and wants to buy every single part of your company. If it's a winery, they want to buy the vineyards, they want to buy the wine, they want to buy the cellar, the barrels, the tanks, everything they want to buy, except they don't want to buy the label. They want to put their own label on this product. Good. Okay, fine. Now you have a label to sell. And if you have done really crummy marketing, you sell that label for $17,000 to Fred Franzia, which is, in fact, exactly what Charles Shaw, Two Buck Chuck, did to Fred Franzia. If you have done spectacular marketing, you sell Ravenswood, which, again, has no vineyards uh, um, and only a, a, a rude, a, I shouldn't say rude, but a, a, an industrial production facility to Constellation for $145 million, or Mayomi, or The Prisoner, both of whom sold to Constellation for over $300 million. No winery, no vineyards. All they were selling was the name. That is great marketing. So a brand is worth real money. And the question is, how much money? Perfect question to ask. And the answer is, whatever you can get somebody else to pay for it. If it's valuable, it should be worth money. So. What I suggest, every morning you get up and spend 20 minutes, half an hour, or three times a week, spend 45 minutes or whatever it is. But you should just get up and say, today, for the first 45 minutes, the only thing I'm going to think about is how do I make my brand worth more money? And by the way, if you have a company, you already have a brand, whether you know it or whether you know what it stands for or not. So let's get started. How do you create a brand? Well, most people think the way you create a brand is that you create, you start with your logo. But I'm going to suggest that in order to create a logo, you need a couple of other things first. And the first one is a mission statement, a positioning statement, and a tagline. Okay, so let's talk about each one of these individually. Your mission statement is a vision. It challenges you to live up to a goal that you are aspiring to achieve. So a mission statement is not, we're a good winery. It's, we, want, we are the best winery west of the Mississippi. That's a real mission statement. But it also is specific enough that it gives direction for every question facing the winery. Well, should we make Zinfandel or should we make Gewürztraminer? Let's look at what our mission statement says. Uh, again, remember I once worked for a brand where the, the owner said their mission statement was to be the leading producer of Burgundian varietals in America, and he made three wines. Yes, he made Pinot Noir, Chardonnay, and Zinfandel. And I said, you know, that's not consistent with your mission statement. It's going to confuse people, and you ought to stop making your Zinfandel, even if your wife really loves Zinfandel. But it really does give direction for every question facing the winery. If you are, if you have the best customer service on the planet, if that's your mission statement, then golly, there's a really good answer every time a customer calls. You have to exceed their expectations. And of course, this mission statement also gives focus to your marketing. What do you talk about? You talk about the things that effectively communicate your mission statement. Want some examples? Explore and exploit the essence of our vineyard. This is a pretty limiting mission statement. Um, but it does say we are a single location. We have a single basic product, which is of wines from this specific vineyard. And all we're going to talk about is our vineyard. It's extremely limiting. Uh, there's no potential for growth here. Uh, there is potential, theoretically, for an increase in price. Uh, but not in quantity because the vineyard only ha can produce so much um, product. So a limited um, mission statement wouldn't be my choice. But here's another one. We want to be we are the leading winery in Texas. Now, leading winery, of course, there are a lot of different definitions for what a leading winery is. But leading winery in Texas, that is clearly a mission statement that then goes to, gee, what do you think we should do in this situation? Well, let's see what other wineries in Texas are doing and how, see how we can get out in front. Let's out, say how we can argue that in every case, in every way, uh, we are leading the wineries of Texas to the promised land. That's a great mission statement. 
Uh, another one, we create a unique experience for every visitor. This is a very customer-centric mission statement. Uh, I like it because of that, because it means that when somebody shows up in your tasting room, the first thing they're going to be told is, how can we make your visit um, more interesting and more successful? You have a challenge. As you grow, that kind of customer service, creating unique experiences for every single visitor becomes more difficult. Yes, again, like the first one, you can raise your price, but in terms of increasing quantity and increasing sales volume, that's actually gonna be more difficult with a mission statement like that. So looking at how these work, um, you will see that every mission statement has limitations as well as opportunities. The leading winery in Texas, that's great, but you're never are going to catch up to the leading winery of France or California, at least not in your lifetime, because that's not the way the world works. Here are some examples of really lousy mission statements. We're going to see if we can make this whole winery thing work. Yeah, no, um, don't tell me that this is all just a wonderful adventure and you're just seeing what happens. That's not a marketing mission statement or as my dear friend up in Lake County likes to say, we've got no plan and we're sticking to it. Uh, that's not a mission statement. That is an expression of a lack of leadership. It's an expression of a lack of vision, and it doesn't inspire confidence to pe with people. Uh, we're trying to make the best wine we can. Isn't everybody? I once asked this question in a room full of winemakers. I say, who isn't trying to make the best wine they can? Not a single hand went up. So I don't think that's a mission statement. Um, simply trying to be good, not a mission statement. You need to put a stake in the ground and say, we're this. And then finally, uh, a mission statement, yes, it has to be unique. Yes, it has to be obviously, to, it has to serve to differentiate you sell your Sorry, let me do that again. You have to differentiate yourself from the competition, but a mission statement can't be, well, we're different from the competition. Uh, that's defining yourself in terms of your competition, and ultimately that gives them the power to say, no, they're not. Look, we do this, we do that, we do all these other things. They're not different, and that's a big mistake. What you need to talk about in your mission statement is you, not the competition. So to build a mission statement, you kind of need to understand where you are in the market. And there are a couple of really basic positionings in any market. If you're the best, you're the best. And that's a great positioning. And if you can get that positioning, fabulous. Um, if you're the least expensive, again, you're going to have competition for that. But as long as you can effectively manage means of production to achieve that goal, you've got it and everybody knows who you are. Um, examples from the world of soft drinks, Coke, the original, and Pepsi, the new generation. Quite clearly, one is the leader, but the next one wants to position the first one. Pepsi wants to position Coca-Cola as the drink of old people, and young people drink Pepsi because that's the coming generation and soon will take over the world. Very clever, brilliant marketing by both of them because, of course, Coke also argues that when you finally grow up, you'll drink Coke instead of Pepsi. So both of those are enormously successful, not surprising because they're among the most highly recognized brands on the planet and they have brilliant marketing teams have been doing work for um, decades. Um, the, other, the other possibility is, are we the best at something? Are we the outlier in this particular element or this particular area? Now remember, there are 150,000 wines in the U.S. market. So if you're going to take a position that puts you out there, you need to make sure, first of all, you kind of are out there. Yeah, and, and to be clear in marketing, you don't always have to be all the way the most it helps to be really far out there and talk about it more than anybody else because that will help um, but the other element is do consumers care about it and here again we get back to one of the big challenges in the wine industry which is do consumers really care about what you uh, what you're talking about when you explain how you're different want some examples well if you have a brand you have a position and in, in uh, what that means is your customers already have an image of your brand in their minds. The question is, do you know what it is? 
And most companies, at least small companies, don't really have a sense of this. And when they do find out, it's usually someone talking to the owner. And of course, if you're talking to the owner of the company, it is a rare individual who's going to turn to that owner and say, uh, here's what I really think of your company. They'll tell you if they like it a lot. They'll tell you if they're extremely unhappy, but they won't really give you the kind of insights you need. But of course, this is what marketing is all about, is figuring out, first of all, what do people actually think of this company? And then, okay, how could we affect that? How could we change that? How could we move that in a way that would be effective? And then finally, okay, we know what they think of us. We know how we might be able to change that. Now, what do we want them to really think of us? In other words, what do we want our brand to be? And that is the $64,000 question for those of you who are old enough to remember that show. Example, friendliest winery in Texas. That's a clear positioning. Now, are they the friendliest? Eh, they probably have an off day where they're not, but the, f the fact is when you walk in their door, you know what to expect. They're making you a promise. You're going to find the friendliest winery in Texas. And the wonderful news is as long as they deliver on that promise, they're golden. And how does that affect everything they do going forward? perfect. They know exactly what questions or what answers to every question. Well, when people come in the door, we don't know if we should greet them at the door or when they get to the tasting room. What would the friendliest winery in Texas do? Heck, they'd greet them as they're getting out of their cars because they're the friendliest winery in Texas. So good positioning, good clear vision, perfect way to build a marketing campaign the best Tempranillo outside of Rioja. Okay, now you're saying we want to compete head-to-head -head with the leading red wine region of Spain. Fair enough. Uh, and you are now going to make every effort to deliver on this promise. And that means you've got to stand up and, for example, you've got to act like you belong with the wines of Rioja. You've got to invite them to your winery. You have to do co-promotions. You want to become part of the Tempranillo movement throughout the world. And then, of course, low price leader, Costco and Walmart, they show you how to do this. Uh, just get your prices lower than anybody else and make that demonstrable. Easy. Not examples of this. We're a small family winery, blah, blah, blah. Or we're pretty good for who we are. Uh, you see this in a lot of emerging wine regions, you know, where we, say, we see wineries who say, well, for a winery in Ohio, we make pretty good wine, or we're the, that's, that doesn't inspire confidence in anyone. Uh, you need to talk about who you are and without those kind of limitations. And of course, the worst of all is we make better wine than some of those other folks, because all that has to happen to have that blow up in your face is you say that three times, and the fourth time someone says, well, that's funny, because at the most recent recent wine competition, my wine got gold and yours got a bronze. So I think you're blowing hot air out your hat and you're, you're destroyed. So m claiming that you make better wine than other people, probably not a good solution for this. And then the tagline. The tagline is how you take that positioning. Remember, the vision statement gives you where you want to go. The positioning is where you are now. And the tagline is, okay, this is what we're going to say to get to where we want to go. It captures the essence of your brand in a short phrase, okay? Coke is it. Boy, it doesn't get much shorter than that and, or, or more essential. But it also means something. It touches something in the consumer. The best built American cars assembled from Japanese parts in Mexico, that's not a tagline. That's just confusing. Um, and so you need to come up with something that's short, sweet, to the heart and really communicates where you want people to go with your product. And of course, it goes on everything, everywhere, including on my little computer right here where it says there's Intel inside. That's a tagline. Uh, let's see if you can guess where these come from. Spend less, live better. It's a beautiful tagline, by the way, for what they do. Obviously, their positioning is we're the low-cost leader, but of course it communicates not only the effect on you, but ultimately the benefit to you. So you spend less and you live better if you shop at Walmart. And the fact is, if you can buy the same product for less money, that leaves you more money to buy it. other things or do other things, 
beautiful tagline, perfectly positioned for it's not we're the cheapest because that implies and our customers are the cheapest. What this implies is that our customers are smart because they spend less because they want to live better. Beautiful tagline. Anybody recognize no wimpy wines? That's Ravenswood. And it speaks to the way Joel Peterson, the founder and visionary of Ravenswood, uh, speaks about wine. He's open, he's forthright, uh, he's no nonsense, he loves to tell a good story, and he simply won't stand for wimpy wines. I want wines that reach out and touch you. Well, that tells people what to expect. And of course, he even translated it into Spanish, for those who speak Spanish, No Vinos Sin Huevos, which is slightly obscene and very funny and exactly in keeping with No Wimpy Wines. Great positioning, great brand. Remember, he sold that brand for about $145 million to Constellation. And the last one is Legendary Napa Valley. We know what that is. That's the Napa Valley Visitors and Convention Bureau uh, tagline. But legendary Napa Valley communicates everything you need to know. Because while other regions may talk about how wonderful we are, legendary is legendary. Uh, we don't need to explain who we are because we're legendary. You may need to learn about the best kept secrets of one region or another, but you don't need to learn about Napa Valley because we're legendary. Pretty great marketing. These are not good examples of taglines. Good wines, or we make good wines, or one of my one of the ones that drives me crazy. Our wines are good value. So there isn't a wine on the planet that has sold to a customer that that customer didn't think this is a good value. Because if it weren't a good value, the customer wouldn't buy it. So given that, saying that your wines are a good value is ultimately saying our wines are exactly like every other wine in the world. Not a good tagline. Uh, come and see us. Why? Why should I come and see you? What are you offering me? Rather than say, come and see us, tell them what to expect. Make a promise that you can deliver on with your activities once they get there. And then, of course, my all-time favorite in the wine industry, a unique expression of the winemaker's art, which is true of every single wine everywhere on the planet, which means the first word is complete nonsense. It isn't unique. And in that case, we're just wasting everybody's time. So, how many customers do you need? Where are you going to find them? How can you make those customers yours and yours only? That's the next part of marketing. And this is the part that gets even more fun. So, really simple here. Four steps. Develop your message. Identify your audience. Deliver the message. Evaluate the results. We'll talk about each step individually, but... Let's dive right in with develop your message. How are you going to build your brand? You need to lead a category. Um, this is one of the basic goals of marketing is to be a category leader. If you want some entertainment for yourself sometimes, call up 15 wineries that you've met over the course of your, of your work in the industry and ask them what category they're in. They won't be able to tell you and yet they'll do marketing. I always explain this is a little bit like saying, yes, we want to win an event in the Olympics. Great. What event? Well, we haven't decided that yet. So somehow you're going to do marketing. You're going to lead a category, but you haven't decided what category you're in. So step one, define your category. Step two, own a word in the consumer's mind. No wimpy wines. Great. Ultimately, this will create value for your company. When you decide to sell the brand, how much is it worth? What you do in this specific series of steps will determine the value of that company. And of course, all of it helps sales. And you can't do this in a vacuum. Marshall McLuhan, wonderful expert on communication, says propaganda ends where dialogue begins. That means you have to listen to your customers. You have to listen to the market. You can't just talk. So where do you apply all of this? Well, these are the four famous, the famous four P's of marketing. And if you haven't taken a marketing class, you should have. Uh, and, but if you haven't taken a marketing class, here are the four P's. And these need, these are, these should be tattooed on your forehead in reverse. So when you get up in the morning and look in the mirror, you see promotion, placement, pricing, and product. These are the four ways that marketing experts determine you can affect the perception of your product in the world. 
So promotions, placement, pricing, and product. Interestingly enough, by the way, if you want to ask American consumers which of those four is the clear indication of quality in a bottle of wine, they will tell you way above the rest price. They would rather spend more because they know they're getting a, ver a better wine than spend less and get a less good wine. And the interesting thing is, at the same time, they will tell you, you don't always get what you pay for in wine, but when I buy an expensive wine, I get a much better price. I get a much better product, a much better experience. And there's a ton of consumer research we can talk about this, but ultimately it's a self-fulfilling fantasy because when you convince yourself that this wine is worth the extra money, you are automatically convincing yourself you are going to enjoy it more. And the truth is all sorts of research has shown that when you open the bottle, you will absolutely enjoy it more even if the product inside that bottle is identical to a product that you bought for less money and were convinced wasn't going to be as good. Fascinating studies, fascinating research, but they are self-fulfilling prophecies. Again, we're back to Marshall McLuhan. Cost-effective communications. Let's talk about how you can communicate these various elements to the people in your market and, and in your world. And by the way, we're going to do a separate little section on advertising later, but let's talk through each one of these and see how they play out. How do you convey quality? Well, um, you talk about scores, you talk about prices, and again, if you have 96 points, that's good. If you can sell your wine at $100 a bottle, that's way better than 96 points because who cares about points if your wine is selling? And of course, your own marketing conveys quality. Uh, everybody gets good scores these days. Uh, what was it? 7,000 wines last year approximately got scores of 90 points or higher from the wine spectator. Prices? you should charge exactly as much as you possibly can and still sell through in a year. So then the question is, how do you convey quality? That's what marketing is all about. Remember, I, I know some of you may have sold a house, some of you may not have, but you've heard about staging a house. When you sell your car, the first thing you do, you go get it detailed so it looks as beautiful as possible. That's marketing. And now we're doing the same thing with your wine. We are positioning your wine. We're putting it in the most beautiful bottle. We're putting it in the most beautiful location. We're putting it in the best possible scenario so that when people look at it, they say not, ooh, that's a $10 bottle of wine, but they say, ooh, that's a $20 bottle of wine. Uh, one of my favorite stories along these lines is I have a panel of experts that I convene from time to time to taste client wines. And we tasted through a bunch of Malbecs from Argentina. And my client's wine had ended up pretty much in the middle of a pack of $15 Malbecs. And everybody agreed it was pretty good value for the $15, but so were the rest. And that was all very good. And when we showed them the label, a couple of these experts said, with that label, that's a $20 bottle of wine. And I thought, that's the definition of what a good label can do for a product. These were experts. They knew the wine, but they also knew what the impact of a label would have in the market, and they nailed it. So let's go back to those four Ps. Pricing, and I've added a fifth one here, you'll notice, packaging. Placement, both in sales and promotions. Promotions, and finally, yeah, you do have to communicate it in your product. Does that sound hard? I love this quote from Frank, Frank Lloyd Wright who says, except as I were given some well-defined limitations or requirements, the more specific the better. There would be no problem to work with, nothing to work out. Why then the artist? And this to me gets at the absolute crux of marketing, which is it's really complicated. You can, com you can compile an enormous amount of data, but in the end, it takes a certain amount of art to pull this off successfully. And that's why marketing is so much fun. Going to communicating quality here. Pricing, what do consumers use to evaluate the quality of wine on a shelf? Price, show them 12 bottles of wine and say these range from $8 to $27, which is the best? They'll point to the $27 bottle of wine. So how have you priced your wines? Are they priced to, to give the consumer 
the message that we are a top quality wine. Uh, again, ideal pricing, the day before the next release, your last bottle goes off the shelf and they're ready for the next shipment. Perfect. If you price your price too high, the wine doesn't sell perhaps, and then it's time to release your new wine and there's still a thousand cases to sell. On the other hand, while some wineries have managed to do this successfully, it's generally not a good idea to sell out completely. Uh, customers become frustrated with this. This is particularly true if you're either a retailer or a restaurateur because when, when you run out of the wine, they pull it off the list. They no longer have it on your shelves. I mean, you come back four months later and say, hey, I've got product again. They say, yeah, where were you three months ago? I needed this and you told me you didn't give me any. So running out is also not a good plan. And there are some wineries who take the position that we're very careful that we only sell at this price. We have to be very careful with our wines. We basically sell our wines as if they're rare jewels and there's limited scarcity, just like diamonds. Well, here's the wonderful part of that. Diamonds aren't scarce. The De Beers company has managed that market brilliantly for many, brilliantly, that's a diamond joke, uh, for many, many years. But at the same time, um, if you're not selling out of your wine and you're telling people they can only buy one bottle per customer because it's very rare, by the end of three years, you're sitting there on two, three, four thousand cases of wine and it didn't work. So the, the concept of managed scarcity, that you're only selling this out in dribs and drabs because there's very little of it, it only works if you really are selling out every year. If you're not selling out, it's a big mistake. So let's talk about your packaging. Um, obviously, does the tagline go on the label or at least on the back label? I would say it probably should, particularly if it's a good tagline. And if it's a bad tagline, you probably need to come up with a good one. What communicates quality to people who are buying wine? Interestingly enough, things that we don't often think about. You think about the design of the label, but what about the quality of the paper that it's printed on? Uh, we've all seen the labels that look like they're printed on kind of cheap paper, and you think, hmm. um, the cork, um, you know, you've pulled off the capsule of a bottle. The capsule can communicate quality. The, the tin foil capsule's much more attractive than little tear-off plastic ones. Uh, even the box that it's shipped in, the weight of the bottle, all of these things communicate quality to the customer. So if you're trying to charge the best possible price for your brand, you need to look at every one of these elements and say, how can we deliver on this promise? And again, two buck Chuck, that famous marketing coup of Fred Francia, it wasn't that he was the first person to sell wine for that kind of price. It was the first person to sell wine at that kind of price and put it in a bottle that looks like it could be a $10 bottle of wine. That was the real revolution of Two Buck Chuck. And by the way, packaging doesn't just mean your bottle. It can also mean winery. Is your winery as packaged? Do you stage your winery every day? And parking lot. When people drive up, the first impression they have of your winery is the sign and the parking lot. If it's not communicating your tagline and your brand message, you're already behind the curve. Talk about placements, both in sales and promotions. Uh, where do you want to be sold? Oh, only at the very best restaurants. That's funny. I saw your wines in a closeout bin over at Costco. Uh, well, that was an older vintage that we, uh, that we decided we would just get rid of. That's not good placement. That's a huge mistake. Or in the case of one client that we worked with, um, they had just they had just announced some price increases and all the rest, new packaging and all the rest. But at the same time, they had sold off their old inventory and they didn't sell it to a distributor in Alabama or an airline. They sold it to the absolute local liquor store who then put it in big baskets right inside the front door and even as they were telling their local community that their brand was worth more money they were rein they were not reinforcing that but rather undercutting that claim by people walking into the the most popular wine shop in the region and saying wow i thought these were guys going upscale and look at this four dollars a bottle for that stuff uh, we'll talk about donations and how to manage them it's really a question of where do you want to be seen? And as I mentioned before, if you want to be seen, if you want to develop a market, if you want to increase uh, exposure on premise, that's restaurants, remember, on premise achieves market awareness. Uh, off premise, 
uh, particularly grocery chains, retail chains like uh, Bevmo and Total Wine and more, those are ways to achieve more market volume, uh, at least sometimes if the wine sells through. And then the key element, whichever direction you decide to go, you need to develop a list of those top accounts. Um, where do you absolutely need to have your wine? And for example, Wine and Spirits magazine every year does a survey of top sommeliers around the country to talk about their favorite or their top selling wines in each of their restaurants. And we worked on a project with one of our client wineries to identify which restaurants were were consulted in the survey and we made a very very specific effort to get our wines into every one of those restaurants which meant that every year when that survey came out that clients wines were right there near the top of the list and they could confidently say we are an absolute leader in the on-premise business that's very smart marketing and then the same is true not just in terms of accounts but it's also true in terms of events. Some events are golden, some events are a waste of time, and you need to make a list of the ones that are most powerful for you. Let's talk about how you promote your wine to communicate quality, and we're on the downhill side now. So, first of all, product, but everybody has a good product, and everybody gets good store scores. In fact, uh, the real danger with focusing on scores is that you get a great score and then it turns out the next year somebody else gets two points higher and all of a sudden you can no longer talk about your scores quite the same way. Scores are a reassurance to buyers. They are not a motivating factor except in extremely rare circumstances. So forget scores as being the primary way to communicate quality. They're a, they're a reassurance Okay, fine. I, I, now that I've heard your message, I see, oh, you got some good points. That means you make good wine. They are not a primary motivation for buyers, so don't overwork this one. The key to promotion, of course, and you're not going to be surprised to hear me say this, is tell a story. Create a destination. Create a human connection with the people who are buying your product. Tell a story about who you are and why you make your wine, not how you make your wine. Create a destination when people pull the cork on that bottle. They pull the cork and they imagine they're visiting your winery or they're visiting your region. They're in Tuscany. They're in Mendoza looking up at the Andes, watching gauchos roast, roast an asado over the open fire. That's, that's marketing. And then build relationships because ultimately these relationships will build everything that you need to into your marketing. So relationships with customers, relationships with media, relationships with wine buyers around the country, all of those elements allow you to promote your product more effectively. And ultimately, I believe the real solution is doing better marketing than your competition. I know we're talking about how to be a leader Wineries always talk about how to be a leader in terms of how they're leading in wine making. I think we should be talking about how they lead as wine marketing. And for example, I would give you Silver Oak Winery uh, in the Napa Valley, which has for years absolutely been a recognized leader in the Napa Valley as a producer of Cabernet, an enviable market position where people literally camp out on their, in the parking lot of their tasting room to make sure they're there on the 1st of February when the new release hits the shelves. I mean, this is, this is great marketing. And yet when you talk to the winemakers, not just at Silver Oak, but around the world, they will tell you, frankly, the wines are not cutting edge. Um, they use American oak, which is uh, uh, quite traditional for them, but frankly, not considered the, the best possible uh, solution for California Cabernet. It doesn't matter because the marketing they've done said, this is what we do. We do it better than anybody else. Nobody else can match us. If you want it, here's where you have to go to get it. And it, there's clearly a big chunk of the market that believes this because they sell out every single year. That's great marketing. So how do you tell a good story? And we've talked about this in, in other ways, and we'll talk about it more next week in the lectures on public relations. But do try to remember a couple of basic facts. Stories are about people. They're not about things. They're not about rocks. They're not about rainfall. They're not about grapevines. They are about people. Who did this? How did they do this? Why did they do this? 
And then when you tell the story, whether it's a reader or a listener, give them a way to respond. And that's what makes some of these lectures difficult. You don't have as convenient a way to respond as if I were in front of you in a classroom. But give them a way to respond. Give them opportunities. Do you like this? Get them to say yes. Do you want to hear more? Get them to say yes. All of this develops Remember that performers always say, whether they're actors or musicians, that a performance is not a solo performance. It's an interactive performance, and the audience is absolutely critical to the success of the performance. If you have ever watched a play with a group of actors in the audience, the actors will intentionally and obviously give audience feedback to those on the stage. They'll laugh at every joke. They'll clap at every good scene because they want the performers to feel that the audience is with them because they know that if the performers feel the audience is with them, the performers will give the audience a better show. So you need to give your audience a way to respond to you so that you can give them a better show. Ultimately, you're giving yourself a way to connect with your market. What do visitors want when they go to a destination? Again, this is not about the kind of wine they drink. It's about lifestyle. If you look at Legendary Napa Valley, the website, frankly, there aren't any pictures of bottles of wine. There's a glass of wine. There's a grapevine. There's a hot air balloon. There's a beautiful vineyard. There's a beautiful, uh, there, there's a couple having a wonderful meal. It's all about living the elegant Napa Valley lifestyle. That's a destination. When we think of Tuscany, the first image that comes to our mind is not, in fact, bottles of wine. It's those Tuscan hillsides, the beautiful God bless us, they have a name for it, Tuscan Red, which is that sort of uh, uh, burnt ochre um, color that you get in Tuscany, and you've got those wonderful uh, cypress trees. That's Tuscany. Do you want to go to Tuscany? Oh, yeah. Now we can talk about wine. So, again, it's not about the wine. People don't go to Tuscany because they're in love with Sangiovese. They fall in love with Sangiovese because it reminds them of Tuscany. And, again, how do you get them? You get them involved, not just by telling them, not just by showing them videos, but get them involved, get them to visit, get them to participate, get them to do things that make them feel part of the community so that when they go home, the question they start asking themselves is, hmm, what would it be like to live there? If you've done that as a destination, you've achieved your goal. And then ultimately, particularly in your visitor centers, make your visitors feel at home. Greet them warmly, greet them immediately, give them personal recognition. Remember, National Restaurant Association says the primary people reason, the primary reason people return to a restaurant is they feel that recognition. Not because of the quality of the food or the service, they feel that recognition. Recognize the people when they walk in the door. Make them feel at home. Give them something to do when they arrive. Remember, there's even a winery in Napa where they allow the visitors to punch down the caps during the harvest, punch down the during fermentation. Visitors love it. Winemaker loves it, saves him work. But people feel involved. Any way that you can get them involved. The easiest way to create an experience is not to show something. It's to get them to do something. And get that active participation, whether it's a blending seminar. Uh, Jean-Charles Boisset has his new tasting table where you move things around on a table and lights go on and all sorts of excitement. That's an experience. That's fun. That's participation. Uh, heck, lock them in a room and see if they can get out. That's an experience. You, you may want to get their permission first on that one. And then ultimately, we want to talk about creating a community around the brand. Uh, the best source of new business is always existing customers. So make sure you call them, make sure you talk to them, make sure you write them, make sure that you connect with them online and offline. Make sure they know when you're doing a winemaker uh, dinner in their community. Make sure they know that they're invited to such and such event. Uh, make sure they know that you know who they are, that you care about them, and that you will always recognize them when they walk back in the door. That's creating community and even encourage them to meet with other members of the community. Wouldn't it be great if you had a winery that had wine clubs that met around the country for special events just around your brand? That would be great marketing. 
every interaction with a customer is an invitation. So always create a reason to talk to them again. Remember, it's like dating. If you really like somebody, the most important thing to happen on any date is a chance to have another date. Uh, you need to call your customers, whether they be trade customers or retail customers. You need to talk to them, remind them of the relationship, and give them a reason to want to hear from you again. Oh, in six weeks we're going to release our new Gewürztraminer. Do you want me to send you a note, or should I just send you a bottle, or tell me how you'd like me to do that? Give them ways to interact with you that makes them feel like they are part of the community rather than simply a target. Okay, now we get into the real nitty-gritty, and I'm going to go through this rather quickly because the next day's lectures um, are, are public relations in depth. But uh, just to give you an idea of public relations on a, on a s simple basis, I have a very simple definition of public relations. It's relationships with publics, and of course the key element here is to define all the publics that your winery has. We won't do it today, we will do it in our next lecture, but trust me, there are a lot more publics than immediately come to mind. And then of course your goal is to develop a campaign that addresses each one of those publics, not just for example the public, as in the general wine consuming public, not just wine writers, but every public that could possibly have an impact on your brand. Um, and, and we'll talk more about that in the lecture to come. But it must be absolutely consistent with your positioning, and you need to execute against this every day. This is how you build community around your brand. And when you build community around your brand, your brand gains power, it, it gains impact, it gains clearly that human connection and the human connection is ultimately what you have to sell when it's time to sell your brand. You do this through promotions. Uh, how can you reach your existing publics? Which are your publics? What kind of promotions can you do? And then another way to look at this is, okay, let's say we want to expand into some new markets. How could we create promotions that would bring us into contact with a new group of consumers or a new group of trade beyond our existing relationships. Uh, when Santa Margarita looked at the USA and said our next big target is the USA, the first question they asked is how can we reach an identifiable public in that new market? And boy, it was a brilliant execution of that plan. Got suggestions on how to do this? This is a perfect subject for a brainstorming session with your team. Some of the examples you might consider, wine festivals, absolutely. Um, but remember that wine festivals share attention. If you're one of 60 or 100 or 400 wineries at a wine festival, you're not gonna get the same attention as if you were the only host of an event. Uh, when you do donations, this is a particular area of, of concern for me because most wineries have a very reactive approach to donations. They get a request, they review it and they decide yes or no. I'm going to suggest a very different approach to that and we'll get into that more in our public relations lectures next week. But I'm going to suggest you start by saying where, which organizations do we want to be partners with? Which ones do we want to have part? Which are, which are part of our mission statement consistent with our vision for the brand? Let's go get them. Uh, and then market visits, we'll talk about how to really develop uh, when you visit a market, what sorts of things that you should do, what activities you should do, and ultimately creating the word of mouth, which these days is the word of phone, it's the word of Yelp, it's the word of TripAdvisor, it's social media far more than it's just people talking to each other. So, quick summary here of wine festivals, which we'll get into pretty, pretty deeply here. When you participate in a wine festival, I believe you should have a very specific goal. What is it you're trying to achieve there? And my goal is there should be a group of people who walk out of that wine festival saying, wow, did you get a hold of that winery over there? I don't care how you do it. I do care that it be consistent with your marketing message, with your vision, uh, mission statement, but at the same time, 
Uh, if you go to a wine festival and you think, okay, my job here is just to pour my wine for people and hope they like it, I'm sorry, I don't believe that is an acceptable goal for a wine festival. Your job is not to go be part of the wine festival. Your job should go, should be to go to that wine festival and win it. And to by winning it, I mean you want to be the winery that people talk about on the way out. How you're going to do that? That takes some creativity. But I had one... Uh, one uh, one of my employees once who went to a chocolate uh, festival. He was pouring port. And we had complaints later. We had complaints from the various producers of the chocolates that there was a group of 50 people around my employee who ha was at this point standing on a chair behind the table lecturing people and pouring samples of port whereas the other chocolate producers there were offering samples and people would come and take a sample and take a sample but he was offering these fabulous ports he was unusual he had the personality to strand up and really take control of the situation and he absolutely stole the attention of the festival that's your goal now go figure out how to do it uh, a lot of people say we have to participate in these because people will notice if we're not there I disagree with that um, in fact I often find that my clients call me and say hey I'm going to be in New York for the New York wine experience along with by the way 400 other wineries uh, can you set up some appointments for me with the major writers in New York for that week and I have to tell them uh, you may have missed that first little footnote there are 400 other wineries in New York and they're all in New York and they're all trying to meet with those writers that is the worst possible time to go to New York and try to talk to wine writers why don't you avoid that event and come back say six weeks later when you'd have the market more or less to yourself and when you start adding up the cost for these things they're expensive you've got to add on uh, the cost of how much wine, travel expenses, plus, of course, whatever it costs to participate. A lot of these charge a booth fee or something like that. So they can be expensive. I want to know, what do you get out of it? I want to know measurable results. Okay, you're going to pour your wine at ZAP, Zinfandel Aficionados and Producers, I think it stands for. Uh, good, there are 100, 200 producers of Zinfandel at that event. What are you going to get out of it? And if you can't tell me some specific goals, if your goal is, well, we just want people to taste our wine, that's not a legitimate goal. There are way more effective ways to do that. Even showing up in a restaurant and having it be a special pour by the glass because the winemaker's having dinner at the restaurant that night, that is actually a better way to do it than standing at Zap and watching people who are tasting three or 200 Zinfandels. You can imagine how sober they are at the end of the day uh, and hoping that you're building some kind of connection with them. Um, so be really focused. If you're going to a festival, how many consumers do you want to talk to? How many trade do you want to talk to? Keep a list. How many, how many um, uh, retailers did I talk to? How many restaurateurs did I meet a wine writer? And I would suggest go to the festival with a score sheet that says, if this event is going to be successful, we want to sign this many people up for our wine club. We want to give out this many coupons to customers who are going to come for a free tour at the winery uh, and we are going to talk to two wine writers blah 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 at the end of the at the end of the day you can then measure up this is what it cost this is what we got out of it and at the end maybe you can decide whether it was worth it or not but if you don't have goals if you don't measure the impact you can spend an enormous amount of time an enormous amount of effort and money on these things and really not get much out of them primarily because Everyone else will be in town at the same time. We're going to talk about this next week, but my big fear here is that most people tend to donate wine by saying, oh gosh, that's very interesting. Yes, I'll give you a few bottles. I never want to give a few bottles of anything to anybody. What I want someone to come to me and say is, you know, we're doing this event with Cirque du Soleil, and it's a pretty good audience, and I, my first question is, okay, what do I have to do to become the wine of this event? If I can't be the wine of the event, I'm much less interested. And if I am the wine of the event, then what I want to know is what do I get in return? Do I get my logo on every wine glass? Do I get to hand out a brochure to everybody who attends? Do I get the star of Cirque du Soleil to stand up and say, I love these wines?
things. Uh, whatever it is, I, I want to have a list of those things, and next week we'll really talk about what all those things are. Um, but that's what I want in return for a donation of wine to an event. And by the way, this is negotiable. It's not a question of, gosh, they've asked for some wine. Should we give it or should we not? The answer is, wait a minute. If we're going to give you this wine, what can you do in return? And go through all of the elements. Again, more next week. But this part is really trade oriented here, this market visit, and it's something I do want to talk about this week. Um, when you go into a market, if your wine is in distribution, or if you are trying to build a relationship in a new market, you certainly want to talk to the top trade. And there is usually a distributor meeting. So you want to attend, by the way, Friday mornings, most distributors have a meeting where they invite the key members of their suppliers, usually on a once a year basis, but it's every Friday, so it kind of rotates through. Uh, come into the meeting and for 15 minutes talk to our sales team about your brand. The worst presentations are those who come in and say, guess what, we're a small family winery, we blah, 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 blah. What you need to go in and remember that following you could be anything from uh, the owner of Chateau Latour, probably unlikely, but or uh, the Swedish bikini team for a big beer company. There are big names coming in and out of these rooms to talk to these guys. And here's you. Hi, <laughs> I'm Paul. Uh, you need a plan. And this is where it really pays to be very tightly organized, really get their attention. Um, come in with something, again, as a small producer, as a smaller company, a big, a small fish in a big ocean, you're not going to get all the people in the, in the room excited. But if you can identify a few people who are really important to your company, who seem to be on board with what you're saying, and build relationships with them, that should be a legitimate goal there. So my goal, if you're a small company when you go into a distributor meeting, is um, I want to find out the two or three salespeople in the room who are really going to move my product, and then I'm going to build closer relationships with them. While you're in town, you want to take some of your key retail accounts out to lunch. Take them to a restaurant that carries your wine, and your job at this lunch is not to talk. Your job is to listen to what they say about the market, take their advice to heart, but this builds that sense of community, this builds that sense that you're not in charge of propaganda, but dialogue, and it builds relationships with those retail customers who are really important for you to, to sell your wine. This is different from a similar lunch or dinner with some of the local journalists who might write about wine. You don't want those two groups together because I have seen this all too often. The journalists start talking to the retailers and all of a sudden nobody's talking about your wines. But yes, invite a few media to lunch and tell them the story and talk about what they're doing. Listen to what they're interested in. Listen to how they approach the market. Again dialogue, not propaganda, but at the same time, this is an opportunity for you to build a relationship with someone who, if they write about you, can deliver an audience of anywhere from a few hundred to a million people to your brand. And then finally, in some ways, I love the idea of some kind of a consumer event, all part of a day and a half in a market. Maybe you do a media dinner or a wine a wine club dinner, a wine maker dinner at a restaurant, and invite a couple of the journalists to sit close to you at that dinner, but you now are in one of your top restaurants in that in that community. You are talking to a group of 20, 30, 50 of your wine club members. You're getting them excited about the brand, and at the same time, you're talking to the journalists at the same time. All of that in a day and a half, that's a well-organized market visit. So, Let's talk about this in summary. First of all, remember we began more than an hour ago talking about what was the goal of marketing? To build a symbol, an image in the consumer's mind, to build that brand. Um, and in order to build that brand, of course, you need to know who that audience is and you need to know how you want them to think about your brand. Once you do, you can create your message. It's a tagline. Uh, it, it plays itself out on all of the marketing materials across all of your 
uh, marketing efforts, whether that be a, a, a case card that shows up in a retail shop or whether it's a little table tent that shows up in a restaurant or whether it's a little blip across an email or a Twitter feed, the message is critical. You need to develop a message that effectively communicates your brand positioning in a, in a very, very um, convincing way. And then once you have that message, you need to look for different ways to identify that audience. It just isn't enough to say, well, the market. The market is massive and you're small. And if you talk to the market, it will be much like a five-year-old child uh, standing up in the middle of a football stadium full of people and starting to talk to the stadium. Trust me, nobody's paying attention. You need to identify a small group of people, ideally your parents, uh, if you're a five-year-old child, um, but you need to identify a small group of people and say, this specific segment of the market, I will have less competition for their attention and I can really deliver on their expectations. My message is going to make a promise. My marketing and product are going to deliver on that promise. We're going to meet those expectations. And when that happens, they will then become part of my core brand, my core brand community. So you've identified your message, no wimpy lines. You've identified your audience. People who are a little bit, uh, let's say, um, counterculture, not the, your traditional, because traditional wine drinkers tend to think of wine as rather elegant and sophisticated. Um, no wimpy wines, that doesn't sound elegant and sophisticated. That sounds sort of back to your roots, all American, yee cowboy. Not a bad message, um, because it eliminates all that puffery around, well, wine and at the same time identifies a very clear audience. The very clear audience is people who really care about the wine, not about that other stuff. Ironically, you're using classic marketing methods to eliminate people who care about other elements of wine. And then lastly, you deliver that message in a way that's believable, in a way that's effective, and that it reaches the target audience. In the case of No Wimpy Wines, there were some ads. Of course, there's the label, which is strong, woodcut, powerful, not wimpy at all. But most importantly, there's Joel Peterson, who you can say many things about Joel Peterson. He ain't no wimp. Uh, he likes to shoot from the hip. He likes to talk from the heart. He likes to tell good stories. And when he talks about wine, you get a sense that he's really laying it on the level for you. He absolutely is the right mechanism to deliver that message. And what he did was travel all over the country for many, many years doing exactly that. He knew his message. He knew his people. He delivered that message to those people. And in the end, you know it's working by a whole series of metrics, whether they be business cards collected or people signing up for your newsletter, people signing up for your wine club, or of course, the most um, um, definitive metric of all, people buying your wine. Hope you found this helpful and we'll continue on with some other stuff in our next lecture. Whoops. Ha. One last fun thing here. Uh, do develop your goals and budgets. Uh, remember, every time you spend money, you want to be able to demonstrate what you get back in return. Um, always look to measure those results, hard results versus I want to have my image enhanced. Because image enhancement, uh, very hard to measure. I always tell people if you'd like your image enhanced, you should probably have someone better do your hair. That'll enhance your image. It won't necessarily sell your product. And in the end, if you do marketing this way, if you do spend your money efficiently, able to generate and demonstrate the results you've got, you will be accountable, which will make all marketing seem better. And that's important for all of us because we're marketers. Thanks. Hope you enjoyed this lecture. I look forward to seeing questions, comments, uh, and discussion as we move forward.